let's bring Dr. Najad in. Thank you everybody for coming back. And we'll bring Matt in. I hear Valco in the background. Yeah, he's he's angry because he has to go take a nap. Do you see mine? Management. Oop. What? Do you see talks? Oh no, I'm I, I can't because I'm putting up the uh, the oh. topic here. Quality. Tux. Comment. Tux right here. Tux say hi. Comment box. Please. Okay. Let me post this so we'll keep going so you, went, you went over a lot of good stuff and i think helpful for anybody at um at any fee schedule really it's, it's some basic things that they can do the life. yeah it's, it's like he looks like a blanket <laughs> tux tux he didn't wake it up. Uh, he's alive i promise um yeah it's so important because if you can't do these levels of quality, like I'm not saying, you know, none of us are saying that it's got to be top quality Instagram show worthy, but it's like, you know, if you're going to get your car fixed and it's already got a leak the minute you walk out, what did you pay? You know, like competing on price yeah. is fair, but you have to have a certain standard. And the, the reason I think this is worth talking about is because even though it's common sense, it's kind of like 90% of the time these standards are not withheld at the lowest price point. So to me, that says either there's got to be a little more accountability or some change in the industry. But look at the, cri the criteria. Look at the situation we're in right now. How do you how do you slow down? Like, you know, we're lucky that we already see few patients per day and spend more time so we can make some changes, but how do you make the same changes with infection control and whatever, and do these things at that price point? Yeah. So if, if this was already addressed at previous times, like in other words, if insurance paid a slightly higher rate to begin with, one of the craziest things I still can't wrap my mind around for the life of me is how when your dad was practicing 30 years ago, insurance paid $1,500 a year maximum. And 20, 30 years later, it's still $1,500 maximum. I heard the other day from a patient that you guys raise your prices every year. I'm like everything, like my rent goes up. My staff wants more money. Everything goes up. Like, why? Why would cars we not? are more expensive? Like, it's not gas like, is more expensive. Yeah, this is, you know, and and the worst part of all is that dental insurance for the people that are in the offices that are really heavily insurance based, it hasn't like if I think I've made this analogy. If it were to be just continuing with the times and how everything else has changed, then insurance should probably, on average, be doing seven to ten thousand dollar annual max right now because back then i've heard numerous people tell me they could do four or five crowns at three hundred dollars that were yeah. the equivalent of like eleven or twelve hundred dollars today so you patient would come in with insurance they could get a bunch of stuff done now you can barely get anything done so you know like it's it, it's a whole conversation on its own but it starts from the ground up so yeah i think Without any further delay on that, I think it would be good to hear from a surgical standpoint because I have I have questions for you. I want you like as you do this to think about some of the materials. I mentioned some materials here and there, but from implant dentistry, a lot of the cost saving can come down to um, some of the materials, the implant companies, et cetera. So like as you go through some of these questions, think about what you think is acceptable at different price points. I know, and uh, I hope it's not a secret, I know we've used in the past when we were first starting different materials that were much yeah. cheaper. And I want to get your thoughts on, you know, how that can be incorporated into a more cost-effective but fair quality workflow. So yeah, first we question. Had a comment. Someone said, what a privilege you got having uh, Paolo Battistella working for you. It definitely is a privilege. We are lucky to have Paolo. Absolutely. It's, it's, and that's, day to day. You know, um, yeah, that's always been a dream of ours. I think ever since we saw Scal and Michelle, like 
treating a patient together, we've always wanted that. And it's, it's difficult to do at other price points, I think. Um, unless you're at like a very high production style and then you can have your own lab in house too. But I think the middle tier, it's hard to have in house technician because of the, because of yeah, the price. You know what? People should know by no means, some people manage to incorporate technicians and make it into a cost saving, you know, paradigm, right? Mm -hmm. Like I have this, I save on lab bill. Our goal wasn't to do that. And in fact, we haven't saved on lab bill. What we've done is yeah. invest in pushing the limits. We wanted to be able to kind of invent and grow together. So with Paula, we couldn't be even, you know, even I couldn't have imagined how lucky we would be to find somebody that's so aligned on the concepts of biomimetics and quality. And I've done cases with them. You've done cases with them where every step of the way, he's so open and receptive to like uh, change and improving. It's not like, oh, this is really good. It's more like, how can it be better? So that type of mentality and growth is what we're really fortunate to have, but you can find all sorts of options from cost savings to that. But in our case, it was for this reason. And it is truly amazing to have that luxury of being able to get what you want and kind of define and grow together. Cause you know, some dentists want this, some dentists want that. And I've heard technicians say a lot that just cause you want it this way doesn't mean it's like what everybody wants and it's true. So when we get to grow together, we get to like define our own style. Yeah. Yeah. Someone said there's so much common sense in what you say. Thank you for that. that rear voice among real voice among dentists and in industry. Oh, that's a really nice comment. It should. It, it is. I know. See, as we're talking, I hope it, it is common sense, but it needed to be said because it's every day we see this type of stuff, you know, and the key is it's not even cost, you know, like I'm not saying if you, you said at the beginning, if you charge more, it doesn't guarantee it's higher quality, but we take, you know, when, when I define my quality, I don't like the fact that one of my selling points is that the margin is good. Do you know what I mean? Like that should be take, that should be like a given, you know what I mean? Like I, I would have it be the stuff you can't see the bond, the seal, or so actually you can see some of it, the anatomy, but like a lot of it is like the science and the steps and the care, but not just that it fits well on the outside. Anyhow, right, let's get to be, some of the uh, surgical yeah. stuff. Okay. So critical items. Um, I have three on this. Number one, I would say would be pilot hole, guided surgery. And I know people are going to say what you, one of your critical items is guided surgery. And five years ago, I would have said that's not a, not, not a possibility. But now you have open set systems like Blue Sky Bio that doesn't cost anything. I think there's export fee. And if you have printers, and especially these kind of larger, uh, more production style um, practices, you know, a $3,000 printer may, you know, 3000 a lot of money, of course, for anybody. But when you think of, if you're doing a lot of implants and you can get a, a guide for 50 to 70 bucks and potentially save, I don't know, 70% of the complications by putting the implant in the correct position. And with pilot hole, you don't, don't have to buy like I said before you don't ten thousand dollar guided kit so it gets you a way to have one of my my standard of care for implants which would be the implant in the correct position at a, a very, very low cost and pretty easy I would say it is it's not even I think that's a reasonable price three thousand dollars plus the fact that you can print your own you know I've seen you printing all the guides we've been using uh, Past, I won't say recently, but past two years or maybe or so, at least two years. I don't know. I've lost track. But you've been printing a lot of them. Yeah, and three three years, I think. Mm -hmm. Three years. It's it saves cost. It is doable. There is ways to save these. I think that's a reasonable request uh, to be able to do that. So just to clarify, though, pilot hole guide means it's actually still planned digitally, and you know, like the guide, the pilot hole is like lining up with the position of the implant in the bone, not just like the contour of the tooth, like yeah, a so, suck down guide. Correct. Yeah. So still planned digitally. And like I said, it can be done with free software. The pilot hole is the one that starts the osteotomy. So it starts the hole in the bone that will allow your 
other drills to kind of follow that. Now, the drills can still lean a little bit and go off track, but in general, that's the most important drill in your drilling sequence. So I, I also recommend that to be a good starting point for someone who eventually wants to do fully guided. They're overwhelmed with like a new kit and all these other, you know, crazy drills that you start with that and you get the feel of the guide, you know how to print the guides, you know how to talk to the patients and um, that becomes a critical item for me because right. it's, it's easy to place an implant. It's very difficult to place an implant in the correct three-dimensional position. People say, oh, right. well, the implant is just putting it's a, also a, a, a screw it? in the bone. So much less stress, so much less stress. And you know, I'm on that. I talk about that all the time. But um, you take out that first aspect of like, you know, okay, am I too distal? Am I too mesial? You're asking assistant, how does it look? And is it mesial or distal? Okay, keep going. And then you're thinking like, like am I getting nerve? And I'm going to hit the sinus. It you can put drills. Yeah. yeah, you can put one drill stop on that one pilot hole and you can have your depth and your angulation set. And also it takes less time because you're in there. Boom, you go in, you go all the way down to to the drill stop. Okay. And that is another thing that I like to talk about with, okay, so let's say you're spending an extra 50 or $75 for that guide, but you may save that in chair time. You probably will save it in chair time because placing an implant with guided surgery doesn't take that long. Am I frozen? No. Oh, okay. Unless it's me, that's better. Oh, I'm frozen. Back. Why would why would your um your light? Are you are you changing your uh, ah? You're naked behind it or something. I don't know. One, one to say. It, <laughs> I don't know why it happened. Um, you, good points you brought up, but also like um, let's not forget the liability aspect that you protect yourself. That's from, true. You know? I mean. You start with right planning, you can show the, it, it's a lot harder to show that your issues are because of, you know, negligence and so on. So I'm also yeah, really that's big really on good that. Point. Yep. Yeah, uh, do, do your due diligence to avoid. Especially if you are, uh, you know, like me, you're a general dentist or a total solution provider or whatever. If you're not a specialist, it's always better. And even if you are a specialist, I mean, specialists can get sued just as much as anybody else. But to be able, I always think about this and I say this in my lectures, if you're sitting up on the stand and, you know, the judge says, you know, Dr. Stanley, you place this implant, something went wrong. And this patient is suing you. And you say, you say, you know, your honor, I use CT scan. I use guided surgery. I use a well-designed implant. I use proper biologic materials. And unfortunately, you know, something happened in this case, but you have all of those things behind you supporting you. Yep. We got a couple of questions on these things. Let me run them by you. So um, not exactly, but still worth answering. Not exactly on the topic of how to save, but yep. what software do you guys use in the office? Why don't you tell us what we use and also what's free? Yeah. Okay. So so um, there's two different software. So I use um, Noble Clinician, which is now called DTX Studio. And I also use the NSoft software uh, through MIS, which is actually a software called SMOP that is separate from MIS as well that you can use with other Great systems. Name. And then, I know. And then um, the free one is called Blue Sky Bio. I used it a long time ago. I actually didn't like it, but... I've seen a lot of people using it and really like it. So I think it's really improved, but I just haven't used it for, gosh, a long time. I mean, like seven years or something. So I'm sure it has improved a lot. But a lot it's of people capable use it of doing everything. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I've heard. Yeah. I'm not, right. I'm not a, an expert on it, but uh, a lot Perfect. of that I respect still use it. So. Okay. And another question is how about the CT scan fee? Is it included in the case fee? Why don't you answer that, but also what you think? if it should or shouldn't be, you know, so in our office versus like what you think it yeah. should be as part of the package. Yeah. So our office, we actually don't have a CT scan in our office. It's in our building and um, it's through another doctor that is, is gracious to let us refer our patients to him and take a CT scan. So in our case, we don't include it. It is a separate fee. Um, you know, should it be included? 
there's certain times when I think it should be and certain times when I think it shouldn't be. If it is a, if you're doing like a big case, you know, 10, 20, 30, $40,000, I don't like to nickel and dime patients on stuff. And, you know, you charge a, I'm going to do this many implants, this many abutments. I like to do a case fee, you know, it's 30,000 or it's 20,000, whatever it is. Um, now, sometimes there's certain things that can happen where you do have to add or subtract things. But I think on large cases like that, you can include it, especially if it's in your practice, especially if it's paid off, you know, and um, it's just costing maybe your, your staff some time. And that's also something that can be delegated, which is nice. So that's what I think, yeah. We've seen our fair share of problems. There's people that don't use CT scans in the area routinely and the number of things that could have been avoided, you know, like, again, I understand that there's a cost to this, but ethics doesn't know the price. You know what I mean? There's no, there, there's the right way and there's the best way. And then there's wrong ways. And the problem is you can do all sorts of things to avoid taking a CT scan. Okay. Problem is the people that don't do them don't even do those things. They're not taking the model and measuring and doing this and stuff like that. They're just not taking the CT scan. So if you want the baseline of planning to be intrinsic to like your scan, you take a scan, you have everything you need to keep going. That whole concept we've been talking about, you start on the wrong foot, it doesn't matter how great so you true. are at placing the implant. You could have the perfect angulation, perfect buccal lingual, and boom, you hit the nerve. You know what I mean? It's like, it's just, it's just beyond me to think that people don't realize that if it only saves you one time in your career, or that if it saves 1000 patients a year, not even in your office, that it is a standard of care and you have to do your part. You know, if you don't want to wear a mask right now, because you're not worried about you're, you're taking the fact that other people don't want to be around you and get it. you're doing these things to help as a standard, if, if everyone said, oh, I'm fine, I don't have symptoms from COVID, I'm not gonna wear a mask, how do you know that one person isn't wrong? Well, if we say that nobody takes CT scans, we have problems. If some people say, I know my limits, you know that how many people are gonna sneak into, I know my limits, I know what I'm doing, oops, oops, sinus, nerve, this and that. So I think CT scan is absolutely required. And yeah, the machine I think it should be, I think it should be required. And I blame some of the, societies and associations and things that they haven't come up and said like this should be a standard of care mm -hmm. because I think the problem is you have so many of these you know people that have been practicing 30 40 years and say well I did it for 30 years without a CT scan I don't need one you know and those are the people that are at the head of these associations I yeah. think that's the problem because you have to think of the lowest common denominator you have to think of the new grad that just came out of school you know even if you could do it like that they may not be able to. So I think having that standard of care would be really nice. You know, that's like you mentioned it. I didn't even think about it because it's such a no brainer. For most people, it's a no brainer, but there's still a lot of people that are, that are not doing it. So well, yeah. and there's people, the, the, the sad problem is there's people that swear they don't need it. And you and I know that they do because we've seen when we've taken the scan, we've seen things, you know, if you don't know, it's, it's blissful. It's so, it's so, so easy to be happy with your results when you can't, when you can hide them, you know what I mean? So right. when we see what's going on in reality, absence of symptoms doesn't guarantee absence of problems. So these are important yeah, steps. Yeah, because okay, so mistakes, mistakes and complications can happen even when you're doing the highest quality even when you're right. taking every oh, step. So imagine when you're not doing that, you know, it's just, it leaves you open. We have a few questions based on what we were talking about. So let me look at these. Um, so we talked about surgical guides. So two, two people asked, do you charge a separate surgical guide fee? So we do in our practice, um, you know, our practice again is a little bit different. We're fee for service practice. We do, and I'll tell you what's interesting about this when you explain it to patients, they don't complain about the cost of the guide. They'll complain about the cost of the crown or the cost of the sedation or cost of something else. But when you explain like Mrs. Jones, in order to put this implant in the correct position, I need to have this, this surgical guide. This will physically guide my hand and my brain to put this in the correct position and minimize the potential complications in the long term. 
they don't complain about that. And it's true. It's yeah. very, very rare that a patient complains about the cost of, um, of the surgery. I agree. No, I agree. It's an, it's not a, it's not a hard concept to place value on patients. Have always, same with planning and a lot of things we do. If it takes a little bit of explanation, but it's not something it, it, it's logical. They think of it. I make analogies all the time to construction and architecture and stuff like that and explain how yeah. we're doing this combination, but it works out well. What do you think though about, uh, actual company, you know, like the cost of like, one company's implant part versus yeah. another you can get some stuff for like a tenth of the price of others is there room to use lower i don't want to say lower quality because i'm not convinced that just because it's cheaper it's lower quality but you know using a lower cost alternative is that acceptable yeah no it's a good question and i'll 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 second what what thomas linkovicia says you can get ideal long-term biologic functional results with any implant system. But the thing is you need to know how to use that implant system. And there are some implant systems that the implant is fine, but they don't have the restorative catalog and that makes it very difficult. Most implant systems now have a well-designed implant that works. Um, you, I would say I would recommend using one that has like a conical connection and doesn't have a polished collar at the top, then you have a little more flexibility with the depth that you can place it at. But no, I think there's, there's definitely room for, you know, value implant companies. And you don't have to use one of the big two or one of the big four. If it's something that, you know, let's say you're in that, that lower fee schedule and you still want to do really good biologic treatment. If you have an implant company that can, that has a, a good design, a strong internal connection, and has good restorative materials or restorative options, it's definitely not required to use one of the big two. Plus, you if know? you do good planning and you know ahead of time, like, you know, the restorative components become even more important when you have to deal with, like, poor yeah, planning. Problem. You know? Yeah, problem. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, if you're placing an implant that's on a straight access and you don't have to angle screws or you don't have to angle abutments or you know use multi-units and this type of thing kind of bread and butter same or, um single tooth implant dentistry yeah it makes it a lot easier for the restorative components yeah i would say like being no expert in implant surgery and being only moderately exposed to implant restorations i mean i do them all the time but there's people that do more that's not my expertise yeah. i've come to appreciate how the system we're using or the company we're using nobel a lot we're starting to use other ones too but i've appreciated how having extra components like this uh multi-unit abutment angled screw channel it, it's nice to know that like you know you have a, a solution but they also already have a part for it that can help you for that so that comes in handy and even though we're planning well see just because you plan well doesn't mean you never need those but at least you know ahead of time what you're dealing with and what yeah. your options are so sometimes we plan knowing we're going to also use the multi-unit right. abutment or the angled screw channel but if it wasn't part of our plan we might place it differently so the planning very important but that can work and you can save a lot right there you know what i mean like when you look yeah. at an implant yeah no i mean the, you know the cost of an implant you can take it from four something to one something you know and from the how about the whole the thing one. like everything up through the how much you think you can save up minus the final crown but all components screw implant impression uh, coping stock or stock yeah. abutment or or even the custom abutment or the collar or the ti base yeah. whatever it is like what do you think you could save like 500 you probably save a few i would i don't know if i would go that high because the components don't get super expensive after the implant but i would probably say in the two to four hundred dollar range okay so that's pretty, Which, pretty, pretty significant. You know, that's, that's significant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's, yeah, you bring up a good point with that. Okay. And the, how about the restoration? Like when you're dealing with implant restorations, there is the way we do it. Is that the only way to do it? You know, you can describe how you like to do these things. Yeah. But is that the absolute requirement you think, or that's just the ideal and it's, you know, I think the way that we do it, balances biology function and aesthetics so i'm going to take aesthetics out of it 
Okay, because at the beginning we talked about we want something that's yeah. biologically stable and functional. That's like our minimum threshold, yeah. right? Um, I think you can do a tie base with a full contour zirconia crown. And there's a lot of labs that will do that for relatively cheap. And that's a good, that's a good biologic material. It's a strong material. It may not be the most aesthetic, but you can have good long-term stability with that and not have to break the bank on, you know, facial cutback or, you know, how we like to do it is like doing a Lisi or Emacs on top that then even is, is layered or something. So, and, and it takes the custom abutment out of it, right? So you're basically, yeah, you don't have to do a custom abutment. I mean, you, you're using a stock tie base, yeah. but they custom still have crown. to design and mill the crown, but that's, that's, uh, How about anyways. screw retained versus cement retained? Is one of them a, I mean, I know we do screw retained, but do you yeah. think that that, does it even make a difference in cost? And do you think that that should be a standard or not, you know, or a requirement? I think that screw retained should be a standard. Um, I've heard, I've, I've heard people say that screw retained is more expensive, but I don't understand why. Hmm. Because if, if you're going to use a stock tie base and if you're going to use a milled abutment, you really only have one custom piece. I think if you're doing cement and you do a stock tie base and a milled, it's the same. And that's even worse because stock uh, abutment, not tie base, sorry, would yeah. have margins that are not ideal and not able to be cleaned. So then you're, you're giving the patient, you're maybe causing a biologic problem. Gotcha. Going back to our minimum standards yeah. on this. I've never seen it to be an actual cost. I've heard that before too, but I've heard it too, but I don't get it. I mean, early on, not recently, I was surprised to find out that it just meant you cement it in the lab and you had a, a shoot for the screw. You know, like, oh, you know, right. it makes you right. know, so like it's still a cemented crown but cemented out of the mouth and yeah, it's a cemented optimal. crown with a hole in it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you have retrievability and good path and all that stuff. So I, I think so too, you know, I mean, it's, I think it's really important to be able to service it and uh, the way you can fill it these days, like so easy to do a decent filling on the top with uh, like whatever, let's say Teflon tape and some dented shade of composite. Shade it still looks closet. good, you know, it looks yeah. good and it's not time consuming. You don't have major polymerization stress issues. Uh, even if it stains, it's serviceable, but you know, it's worth having that. Cause you know, in the long run, we're dealing with complications on these things and it's better to be able to retrieve and access it. And the worst thing I've dealt with on implants is trying to remove one of those, find the channel. It's been so much time. It's so stressful. Yeah. Trying to find where you end goes. up making the, the X, right? So you start yeah. in the center and you go, yeah. oh wait, no, it's not there. Okay, let me no. go to the buckle. Oh, no, it's yeah. not there. Let me go to the lingual. Let me go to the measles. Yeah. Let me go to this. So you make... Everywhere. You end up just having to grind the whole thing off. Square access. Have to make a new restoration anyways. Exactly. Yeah. And I think the, the way to talk to patients about that is, you know, you're not going to buy a car and never change the oil or never yeah. get new tires. And on some of our restorations that we do on natural teeth, we feel like we're going to have very long-term success, right? And it's going to behave like a natural tooth. But I think that there's this idea with implant dentistry is, this is like titanium. This is crazy. This is going to last forever. And, right. you know, you're still dealing with a system with different components, different modulus of elasticity and things can happen. So anytime that we can make it to where it's serviceable and more, you know, biologically friendly, that's, so that's where screw retain comes in. Okay. Yeah. Is there any other, so we, we talked about, um, essentially your pilot hole is a, a requirement, but mm -hmm. the brand of the implant has some flexibility and cost savings there. We talked as long as about. it's well designed. Yeah. Um, yeah so the my crown. On this would be pilot, pilot hole drilling, well designed implant, irregardless of price, and biologic materials. Yeah. Biologic materials like zirconia around the. Yeah. So basically, no restorative components subgingival. So no glaze, no ceramic, no composite, no acrylic subgingival if possible. Okay, let's say you are cement. So screw retain eliminates the problem of cement subgingival, right? Or yeah. almost eliminates. I mean, all you got to do is check the lab restoration before delivery, right? Yeah. But 
what happens by by the way sometimes i've i've done this myself and had to be careful for it when you cement a neighboring crown you get cement everywhere including the implant so you have mm. to double check you know what i mean because mm -hmm. It does happen, you know, um, but the strategy I found, I'll tell you in a sec, actually. So I was going to say, do you think it's possible and acceptable to do a cement retained and also remove all the cement around it so you can avoid this consistently or is it very... No, so, so there's been research on this. They've tested the duplicate abutment mm -hmm. where you, you make a duplicate abutment and you cement it outside of, on that duplicate abutment, take it off and put it on the natural or sorry, on the implant. Yep. you'll still have cement excess and you may have the problem of actually having not having enough cement and having it come off. And then the other way that people have tried to avoid it is actually using a rubber dam. And that's been disproven to show that you still have, you won't yeah. have it in the tissues, which is good, but you'll have it on the restoration. So if you have cement on the restoration, you won't be able to get the attachment from the epithelial cells. And so you'll then have a pocket, which could lead to bone loss, et cetera, et cetera. So, there really isn't a good way of cementing a crown on an implant unless it is, I mean, super gingival is ideal, but 0 0.5 below the gingiva Max. and not using an excess. Yeah. So that, so usually what you have to do if you absolutely have to do cement is you make an abutment and you like a, uh, like out of acrylic or GC pattern, pattern resin or something, yeah. try it in. So make it above the gingiva, try it in, and maybe even like prep it down to exactly 0 0.5. And then that's the best way of minimizing it. Yeah, okay. but still not ideal. Okay, so that's all the requirements. And then um, from a patient expectation, you know, what's reasonable? Let's say they're paying, uh, you know, like implants can range from, I mean, you see billboards for 395, which is all upsell and BS. Yeah. But if you see, implants from the low range to the high range, what's, what should be a patient's fair minimum expectation at a low price point? You know, I think having 10 years with no biologic complications would be fair. Okay. Okay. And why I say 10 years is because biologic complications can happen based on growing of the mouth. So the jaw actually moving. Yep. And then, you know, you can have threads exposed or the tissue can get thin and you could have bleeding. That's not necessarily the problem of the dentist. That's just a biology something that happens. Yeah, that's yeah. just biology. So I think, and, and again, biologic complications. So restorative complications, I'm talking about screw loosening. I'm talking about, um, you know, the crown coming off, fractured materials. I think that is, you know, a part of, being in the part of the body that is really dynamic and gotcha. big forces. So I think, I think that um, an expectation from, you know, as you go up in fee may not necessarily increase that time. That is like the guarantee, let's say. Yep. What it should increase is the time that the doctor spends with the patient, the materials, the aesthetics for sure. Tissue shaping. And yeah, taking those those small amounts to make sure that, you know, they, they don't have that food trap where it really looks natural or the gingiva is nice and pink and you don't see any show through. Um, that X, that higher fee may also increase that, that, that length of biologic problems too. Because you think of, okay, we went from pilot hole to fully guided. That may be a difference of, a millimeter or a half a millimeter in placement and an implant dentistry that half a millimeter can be can make a difference. Yeah, but I feel like if you're not willing to spend the extra money that it shouldn't be a surprise if the restoration is bulbous or the tissue doesn't yeah. perfect, you know, those things take extra effort and yeah. they are not part of the stand, you know, the bare minimums. Those are taking there, it, to say that should be required would price out almost 50 or 70% of the population that wants an implant, you know, like, yeah, so sure. when I see these implants that are these bulbous contours and stuff, I'm not always shocked by it, especially knowing that I'm sure the patient didn't necessarily 
choose that, but they didn't necessarily want to pay the difference. You don't know, you know what I mean? I can't right. assume anything, but when we talk about these steps and they say they haven't had it before, it makes sense. I mean, these are optional steps that make it better, but you know, it should be at least expected that you don't have the cement. I think that part is very important because mm -hmm. we're seeing that as a leading cause of problems a lot. I think it should be expected that we're using an implant system that is either proven or at least been around for some time. I'm a little, I'm a little hesitant to say using a newer, newer company with no track record because if they come and go, the issue I always worry about is like long-term having components. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter if the implant's successful if ten years later you can't even get a component for it. All right. Did you see a big implant, a big implant, a big dental company just went out of business? Did you hear about this? Really I big company. Like, I feel like I did. Helton and Crane. Oh, they did? Oh, no, I didn't. Yeah, unless that was fake news. I saw it on, they, they said that, you know, due to like uh, unprecedented wow. times and whatever, but they, 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 but they, you know, they did the right thing and they said that for the next seven to 10 years, we're going to keep inventory of parts, et cetera, whatever, you know? So yeah. some companies come and go, you never know, you know how these things yeah. work. Someone starts a company overnight. So you got to pick, there's, there's plenty of cheaper options that have been around for some time. There's some really yeah. notable ones. So I think that's important. I think that um, how the crown looks is secondary. Aesthetics is always secondary, but biology, having the implant placed in bone and not having cement are the big things. I don't think tissue shaping, food traps. Uh, it's, it's a tough one, but at the end of the day, it depends on the price you pay. You know, if you're literally paying like 1500 or $2,000, you know, I think that, what, what do you think the cheapest implant should cost surgery, crown, everything? If you, you know, like I, I'll tell you, I didn't answer this before, but for a filling, I think it can be done for about a hundred bucks. You know what I mean? Like, okay. and I'm talking about for like a two surface and a clusal, I think it could be 70 bucks you know what i mean and i'm not mm -hmm. saying that that's the best filling but it can be done especially if you're doing multiple ones in a in that type of office yes so what do you think you can achieve parts crown time for the doctor etc on the low end because it's obviously not 395 right yeah so uh, start to finish from you know non-extraction through bone grafts let's say implant above and crown i would say in the 2000 to 2500 would probably be the cheapest absolutely you could cheapest. go and that would be you know if you have very low overhead um you know it depends on your your geographic area i think because of that but, i think that's a reasonable price i mean in, yeah. in our area the lower end is probably close to a thousand bucks more than that minimum, like 35, 3,800 is the absolute minimum. So yeah. I think that's pretty reasonable price when you factor in it's a crown plus parts, plus a surgery, plus healing, et cetera. But in that price range, I don't think it's assumed or even fair to also add in provisionalization, tissue shaping and stuff like that. So I think that's yeah. why these things, they can be options, but I think, you know, standard. So again, there's a market, like some people are happy with that clunky posterior implant to put a tooth there. Plaque trap is a problem, yeah. but it's not, they wouldn't go back and take that implant out. So I think- Yeah, that, unless that plaque trap causes a biologic problem, I think. You yes. Know? If it's yeah. annoying and they have to floss there, you know, but if, um, if it goes back to that whole like biology and function, which I think is what we're, our, yeah. our outline is here, right? Yeah. It has to be biologically sound, functionally sound. Well, I mean, perfect world would do term. everything, but we can't, yeah. right? I mean, patients, can, there's, there's a large population of people. Dentistry by no means is cheap. Even the cheaper of dentistry doesn't give access to care for so many people, but maintaining a baseline of quality. Now, implant is a luxury. You don't have to have it. One of the best ways for a patient to save money is for us to start maintaining a good quality from the minute you work on a tooth. In other words, intervening with avoiding teeth and the implant. avoiding implants, right? Um, but that doesn't mean that it will never happen. That's our system, you know, but when we have a system that's like designed to lead to implants, everyone works their way there. So the goal is if you can't afford these things, it's even more important to have good hygiene, extra home care and so on. But 
by the time you get to needing them, we have to have options for them. And we see things, the substandard stuff that these guys are getting are these like mini implants. Uh, I've seen stuff that's done. I, I don't even want to say where, because it depends this country, that country, yeah. whatever. I'm not, I'm pretty convinced it's not a dental implant. You know, it literally looks like a screw. Like, I'm not sure what it is, right. but it's not a dental implant. So these are the things that are just uncompromised. You know, that patient, yeah. if you can't get the minimum, then at that point, it's healthiest to do what? Leave it a dentulist or not yeah. restore it. You know, like having an implant is not a requirement. It's sure. a luxury, yeah, but a luxury. This, is, mm -hmm. this is the minimum luxury that we can do. Uh, what do you yeah. think about um, insurance and fee schedules? Have you seen much? I know you'd worked at some offices before we started our office. Did you see insurance fee schedules that allowed you to do some of these base baseline fair qualities or was it? Yeah, you know, I worked, um, I've said it before, when I first got out of my residency, I worked for some DSOs. I worked for, you know, some high end, some low end. And What's interesting is that at many of the DSOs, because of their buying power, they actually use, you know, the, let's say the top two or three implant companies because they, they can buy it at the same fee as, yeah. you know, when you buy 10,000 implants or something, you can get it at that price. So that was interesting at many of those lower fee. Can uh, still packages. use great components. Yeah, I can still use great components. So I think for a lot of our, our younger followers, younger dentists that are working at, DSOs and maybe doing implant dentistry, many times they still may have the opportunity to use the top few well-known well -known brands. Oh, um, yeah. The time, I think, is the biggest problem, I think. And I would say the autonomy, too. If so let's talk about two different practices. One would be a DSO to where you don't really have the autonomy as much, and you're kind of managed by another managing director. Those yeah. are the ones that don't allow you to do guided surgery, wants you to get in, extract the tooth, place the implant, da, 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 do it faster. I think mm -hmm. if you're at a lower fee, but you are, it's your practice or you have partners, you can still do that. And it still allows you, the fees still allows you to do those minimums like we talked about, biological materials, pilot hole drilling, and a well-designed implant, for okay. sure. Um, yeah. There's one more thing I just want to do as a recap here, and that's kind of get your opinion on what- There's a few more questions too. Well, let's do the questions first. Okay. Okay. So one question was, what are my thoughts on flap versus a tissue punch? So I'm much, I rarely ever tissue punch, rarely, rarely, rarely. The reason why is because I want to maintain as much tissue as possible. I think if you've watched any of my master's videos, what the overwhelming theme is, is tissue is so important. And it can be even more important than bone sometimes. I mean, Inyaki shows some stuff where the, the front of the implant is out of the bone and he has big thick tissue and it's been there for 15 years or something. So tissue, very important. I rarely tissue punch now. Um, I will only tissue punch if I've already done some type of grafting, we have an abundance of tissue and it just is going to make it easier for the patient. I would rather do a mini flap, get access to it, and then close it back up. So even on guided surgery, I don't do tissue punching. And I think that that's a big misconception with guided surgery is that guided surgery equals tissue punching mm -hmm. because you can cause a lot of mucogingival problems that eventually lead to long-term biologic problems. Okay. What else? Next question was... When you do anterior single implant restorations involved with soft tissue graft and such, do you do case fee or a la carte? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, most of the time we do a case fee on that. Yeah, so we don't nickel and dime them on that. But again, we're fee for service. So we can look at this and say like, this is gonna be an easier one. You know, we may be able to do it in a few less steps then our, our fee may, may, may get less for that case. Or, you know what, this is going to be really difficult. The access is difficult. We're going to have to do much more steps, much more um, tissue shaping, et cetera. So that may have extra fee, but usually it's given to the patient as, you know, a, 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 um, a treatment Total fee, cost. right? Yeah. And, yeah. and you do the same with a lot of your full arch or your full I arch do the same with like, right? 
for full and even with like single interior stuff, you know, I, I just make sure like if it's a single match, I used to do a, um, an extra fee on the side, et cetera. Now I just literally bundle it in and I talk about how this is the fee in your case and it includes two or three attempts. Like I don't expect to be able to get the perfect shade match on the first go. I do a lot of things to give that, you know, ability polarize using techniques that actually measure the color and calibrate it. You know, a lot of these things that you've been seeing like eLab and so on. But the problem is at the end of the day, if I try it in and it needs a little adjustment, I'm not going to say no. So like, I don't want to be stuck there. And the expectation I have is that I have a fair chance of getting on the first shot, but not. So I lump it all in into a fee, but I do look at the case because I have a, a lot easier time matching certain teeth than others. You can tell the details. You can also tell if it's matching a bunch of other restorations that are like, oh, I'm one, it's a whole lot easier than if it is matching perfectly natural teeth with high detail, et cetera. So I've learned to ballpark that and be clear on what is included, but it's not one size fits all because those are more difficult. You know, it's a lot more difficult to do a tooth with the translucency identical to the neighbor and the white spots and the, all these different details and like three different color zones. So like I look at it and go, that's going to be challenging and has a higher chance of going back to lab. It has a higher chance of patient not being happy or myself. Usually I'm the biggest critic. So we plan it like that, whether it's implant or or a single veneer or even two. Two is a little bit easier, but it's still my standard is that two needs to match very perfectly. So like, it's not like the two in the middle match and the laterals don't. So same ideas, but we, I do. And I know I've seen you doing the same thing where like, if it looks like it won't be hard to match it, it could be a little bit lower than if it is, but we have our ballpark prices on when these things are, um, going to be more difficult, easier, and kind of adjust yeah. our fees. It's pretty standard in the sense that like we have single fees for posteriors, then we have anterior fee, which is relatively straightforward. And then we have our high end, then the middle is just based on, is this closer to being like pretty routine or is it expected to go back two or three times? Yeah. I did this implant crown recently, went back three or four times, but patient was happy on the first go. But I said, we can do better. And we got better, better, better. And he always wanted a little bit wider, which was very challenging because he wanted just a little bit brighter. But that's how we do those things. I think it's nice to not do a bunch of extra fees, but to be clear so that this is the fee for your restoration. So when I present these things, I say that like our fees have a range. And I explain that it's because not all crowns are the same. Like a crown back yeah. here is not the same as here. But in your case, matching this and that and the times, I'm going to include the following things with it. And this is what we charge. Yeah. And I think something that we are good at at our practice is talking with the patients and being open with them, you know, yeah. and telling them up front, this is going to be difficult. It may take me two or three tries to get this. That's why it is the fee that it is. Or, yeah. you know, I may have to. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's a plan and do graph and do tissue. And I don't really know until I'm in there, et cetera, et cetera. So. Oh, the Just worst being very feeling, open with the patient. The worst feeling is to do something that you didn't convey correctly and it seems like failure as opposed to, you know, you know how hard it is, but to say I can do that and not like cover, like I have no problem. You know, you fear by saying that it's difficult that the patient's going to think you're not capable. Not respect you. But I haven't yeah. seen that. You know, I usually say something along the lines of I've, I've done this. the opposite. Yeah, like I I've told them. I respect you more. Right. I tell them I do this all the time, but it doesn't mean it's easy. Like I expect yeah. this. I'm not shocked if it's three times, you know, I hope it's one and I've done that before. I'm going to do everything I can, but I don't want to be like, you know, going on the third time going, this never happens. It does happen like that sometimes, you know, and I also well, this say, was good. I was gonna say sometimes I'm like, sometimes it gets to where it's as good as it's going to get where you're happy with it. I'm accepting of it, but I know that if I did it, whether it's the material difference, you know, the different lighting condition, you know, sometimes it just comes down to like the thickness. You, you see what I'm talking about? Like the, the thickness of the restoration sometimes makes it where it's perfect. 
in this light, this light, and this light. But when you start throwing in like fluorescent light or you have uh, more yellow color temperatures, it's still, you know, like basically getting to the nitty gritty of like opalescence and stuff like that can really right. throw the whole color right. off. But it's good enough under most lighting conditions where the patient's happy. And I just set them up for that, that it's not literally a hundred percent invisible in all lighting sources sometimes other times it is like i've seen it where if you have like in my opinion it's when it's ultra thin that it works out the best ultra thin veneers do the best on these but when you get thicker and you have a crown or an implant it becomes increasingly difficult to get that like truly natural appearance in all lighting yeah i was gonna say that you know talking about complications and hardships and cases, I think was something that I didn't do well early in my career and what caused me a lot of stress and yep. you know, any, any practice management problems that we had had in the past. I'm sure you know which patients I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but now, and I, I think it was because we looked young, we were, and I didn't want to like say something like, well, this could have a complication because I wanted the patient to do the treatment, right? And I knew yeah, that this would help them and this would be good. And now what I found is the more that I am just upfront with the patient, tell them what we can do, what we can't do, how much it costs, no bullshit. Know your that limits. They respect us more, you know? You gotta know your and, limits. And yeah. I'd rather not do treatment. I literally, every time I look at an anterior case, I'm gonna be honest, I enjoy doing them, but I'd rather not do them than to mislead somebody. I'm okay yeah. if a patient goes, that's too much or even that's ridiculous like I know what I'm comfortable doing if I want if I do it three times going back and forth I'm not willing to do that for free so yeah. if I'm totally fine not doing the case but it has to be fair to both of us and what I find is that patients appreciate that but it does pose a very difficult situation in a typical insurance office and that's why oh, yeah. I think that being clear like it is fair to me if it doesn't match perfectly because the criteria of an insurance-based office in that scenario should be that you have a tooth that's functional. Um, aesthetics is a component of it. I'm not saying it's zero, but like given the cost you're paying, we know how much time and effort it takes to be within the same shade range is probably fair. It doesn't have to be exactly the same shape, contour, translucency. That stuff is, it's not included at that price. You know, you can get yeah. close. Sometimes you can nail it, but you shouldn't be expected to have to do that. So, yeah. And, and that's what I tell patients when they come and they have that, I'm not immediately judging anything, you know, like I'm assuming that they may have paid a lot less and now that's a priority for them to like yeah. actually do that. Well, mm -hmm. cool, man. That was really good. I think, do you have any other, I don't show yeah. questions here. Is there anything else or are we let me, let me double check. I think we may have hit all of them. If, yeah, I think we got all of them. Well, great. So, yeah, I hope that was helpful for everybody, you know, whether Same. you are, uh, you know, kind of lower fee schedule, middle tier fee schedule, or, you know, a high end fee schedule, I think there's a way of doing, <laughs> I think there's a way of doing um, quality work at any fee. So um, if you have any questions, reach out to us, we will be putting this on our YouTube. So make sure you guys subscribe to our YouTube channels. And uh, we have a lot more content coming your way. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Have a man. great weekend. Bye, Kyle. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. So let's wait for a few people to come on. And we will bring on Dr. Najad and get this going. So thanks, everybody, for joining. Let's see. Dr. Najad is here. Bring him on. Thank you, everybody. Hello, hello. Hey, hey. what's up? How there you doing? Are. Hey, good. Did you uh, leave your AirPods somewhere, or you have to sell one of your cars to buy one? Buy some. <laughs> my ears are defective, man. They don't stay in my ear. I'm <laughs> really? To lose them. Yeah. Even That's these, funny. even these fall out nonstop. You'll see me doing this, but it sounds much better. So. Yeah, man. I gotta get the if I get the pro ones, it'll work because they have oh, those little. They, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I th thought about it, but I got those big headphones I use them most of the time, you know. Yeah, I'm not those, the, are, those are good. I'm not the biggest user of headphones anyways, because I'm oh usually... Oh my gosh, for I'm me, not I give user. them all day. Yeah. Hey, guys, what's going on? Okay, so I'm going to put a title up for us, Practice Management Quality oh, yeah. Tips. I want to...
I want to grab something too. Give me one quick sub. I'll be right back. Okay, sure. And then I'm going to tell everybody, put comments in comment box. Please. Okay, so we are going to be talking today about practice management and minimum requirements. Dr. Najad will kind of um, introduce it a little better. But thanks, everybody, for coming. All right, great. So you want me to get this started? Yeah, go ahead. All right, guys. So what we want to talk about today is uh, essentially about the interface between practice and quality. Because I hear, first of all, the type of quality that we do in our office, it's, uh, first of all, we love doing it. It uh, takes a lot of energy. We're really trying to maximize every step. But I guess one of the things I always try to drill and stress across to people in courses is that this type of dentistry doesn't have to be 100% the same everywhere because in any economic model, there is a supply and demand curve where some patients can't afford, you know, if you do more time, more effort and do all these things, it's amazing, but not every patient will be able to access care. So the important distinction is that quality doesn't mean it can't be affordable. We have a practice that's built on maximizing every single step of the process. But if everybody were to practice this way, the fear I have is that a lot of patients would be left saying, how can I afford this? How can I get something? Where does that leave me? And that's not the goal. So as we go through this, we want to basically understand and address that there's a market for everything, the cheapest, the fastest, most comfortable, it all exists out there, but all of them have a certain quality threshold and it varies by procedure, but there has to be some level and standard and some sort of measure of what's acceptable. Doesn't mean it has to have like full anatomy or beautiful layering, but it has to be a certain standard. So we're gonna yeah. be talking about that and um, trying to address both surgical and restorative aspects of care and give our opinions on how you can do these different techniques and uh, procedures that we do and what you can do to cut the cost down, but maintaining what we believe are some of the most important quality standards so that you can fit it into your practice and make it accessible. We're also going to talk a little bit about um, insurance and pa patient expectations and so on. So we're really excited to share these things with you guys. Um, we're going to take questions. If any of you have questions, we'll go through them. Either We already have questions, Matt. Oh, good. Good, good, good. <laughs> I'm glad you're watching this. Yeah, when I talk, I zone out. So when you're talking, I'll catch a bunch of them. But you know, we'll definitely incorporate those things. So um, is there anything I missed you want to add on to that? No, I think um, you really did it well. I think from my standpoint, I, you know, we both speak a lot. We travel around, we teach a lot of other doctors. And I know that I've gotten these in my questions, you know, afterwards, some in my courses, someone will come up and say, you know, Kyle, that's really cool what you do. But at my fee schedule, I don't have Impossible. the time to do that. Or I don't have I can't pay the materials to do that. How can I still get the best quality or something similar to maybe what you're doing or your mentors are doing at my, at what I do. And I just had this from my dad. So my dad was watching a recent webinar oh, yeah. and it was someone doing like crazy layering on laterals, you know, using four or five different composites and stains. And my dad said like, I could never have done that in my practice. You know, he yeah. has or had, I guess he sold his practice, but he had, you know, kind of a, a normal um, insurance based practice that he just said, there's no way I could do that. I would have to charge a crazy amount. And when he told me, I said, yeah, that's how much Matt charges. That's <laughs> what he does, you know? So um, these questions are, are real. And, you know, we, I think our mentors came from the high end and so we kind of gravitated towards that because that was just all that we learned but you know that's not what the norm is and like you said there's some people that can't afford that or don't want to pay that even if they can afford it but they don't right. have the time etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think these questions that that you set aside are really good also like i've heard numerous times like i remember when i was starting my you know you know the story perfectly but i started my practice right out of school and 
I had seen that people weren't doing things the way that we had learned in school, like the academic way. And I've heard even in the early days that that's academic or that's not suitable for a private practice. But I firmly believe anything you want to do in dentistry is possible in a private practice setting. It's based on how you market, brand, and convey that. You know, your patients, some will want to sit there all day and get the best treatment and that time and others are too busy or don't want to pay that much or don't have as much time or only what their insurance covers. So it's all possible, but we have taken what I think is like the most academic um, in the sense that research-based really ideal concepts and made them reality. Now we're going to give our input on to what that means, because I get these questions all the time. My brother's girlfriend has a practice and um, she's asking questions on what do you think is the most important aspects of what you do, et cetera. And these are hard questions to answer, but after having thought about them for a little while, I think I'm ready to give some of those and having done lectures, I've answered some of these questions little by little. The goal is to help you do the best you can with whatever circumstances you're dealing with. So yeah, whether that's insurance based, whether you have to work quickly, or whether you have all the time and all the money in the world to do the absolute best. Because, sure. you know, you, that, that brings up a good point. Because just because someone is expensive doesn't necessarily mean that the quality is high, right? No. And we see this all the time. Exactly. And that's, I think, what is sad for patients that don't know. And they assume that if it's expensive, it must be the best. And that's not always the case. Because sometimes, you know, and you've had people in your courses, like I've had people in my courses, some people in my courses are doing really, really quality based work at very fair prices. And they've done some of the things like we're going to talk about today. And then you have the other people that are doing kind of shit work at, um, you know, very high fees. Yep. And I think it's, um, that can be unfair. Yeah, as we go through this, I want everybody to kind of think that the the frame of reference for everything you do should be somewhere along the lines of having your ethical standards, but also having in mind how much time you can commit to that procedure and getting a fair compensation, whatever that is. Like in our practice, I've made it a point never to charge more for a procedure to upsell it. So like you were saying about the bonding, I made it so when I do a procedure on average, I'm getting compensated a a rate that's consistent so that I'm not more inclined to recommend one procedure over another. So that meant when I did huge, huge fillings, the price difference wasn't, you know, and especially if I spend an hour and a half on it, it wasn't the difference between like a couple hundred bucks and a couple thousand bucks. It was closer because I wanted to value my time. Now on insurance, that becomes difficult, but we're going to be talking about how we can really address those concepts in a way that would still make it fair to the dentist, but also fair to the patient. Yeah. Okay. So first question is the standard of care. What is the threshold for fair quality? Okay, so a sort of standpoint. So in dental restorations, I never I look at restorations all the time. And when I treatment plan, if I see something that doesn't have great anatomy, etc, I'm not going in going, I got to replace that I got to replace that. So the way I assess fair quality, and I mean fair is that first of all, radiographically, you have to have acceptable margins, you know, having sub margin, open margin, overhanging margin, that's never fair. doesn't matter what price point you're charging. Those are just out, you know, you can't see the bond. You can't see how well like a filling is sealed, but you can at least make sure it's contacting and closed and not, you know, just wrong to begin with. So I would say having uh, closed margins, um, being pain and symptom free, right? You know, you do a restoration. If it's sensitive, that's not really serving the purpose. And depending on the restoration, having a minimum threshold of longevity. So for like a filling, I would say if you have everything else satisfied, about five years, okay? If you have a crown inlay or onlay, I'd be shooting bare minimum, like in the five to 10 range on those things. But it all starts with the margins. I mean, if you've already put something in that has poor marginal integrity, open margin, you're just literally putting a ticking time bomb in. And that's not fair because at the end of the day, 
we know that's, you know, substandard. We know that that wouldn't pass in dental school and it doesn't matter what someone paid, you know, if, if you can't deliver that, that is below standard of care. And I see stuff that's stained all the time, but I don't have a problem with that. If it's, if it's closed and it's stained, you know, five years old, 10 years old, a lot of these composites are much older than, you know, bare yeah. minimum five years. But I would say I'm going to intervene on a restoration once it already has recurring decay. But what I notice is I'm not really putting fault or thinking it's the restoration's fault if it looks relatively intact and contacting the margins. But when I see open margin, et cetera, that's where it's hard to say that this was acceptable to begin with. And well, uh, I have to tell you, I look at thousands of images with Pearl with my AI company and so many bad margins. It is crazy, well, crazy. I know this sounds obvious. I mean, like, as I say it, I'm sitting here going, who doesn't know this? But it's people do not hold themselves. Like there's no price in the world that would justify having an open margin. You know what I mean? Like it's if true. you can't do it for that price, we're going to tell, like, talk about ways where you can save time and do restorations that are fair for the price point. But it's never fair to have, an, you know, you, it's not a, a procedure or care or anything to call that, you know, an actual treatment. So and do you think that is because... I feel like dentists are generally trying to do their best doing the work. Do you think it's that they're not taking a radiograph at the end I or think that they are, but they're just like, mm, I don't really I have think, the time to fix it or. I think it's a little more. I mean, like of all the things I've done, I've always thought fillings are the hardest things. You know what I, I mean? I think so too. You know, I can see it's like, it, I, I'm good at them now, but it's still the hardest thing. And everything from, you know, it's like you, if you start with poor isolation, then you go to the next step and then everything compounds. You know, when you start off on the right foot, it gets easier. So when we get to some of these things, I'll mention them, but it's really hard to recover from bad preparation, bleeding gums, trying to get a matrix inside there, et cetera. But I think it's a little more. I think it's the whole compound system where you start off on the wrong foot. Okay. You, you have a practice that says, you know, we're going to pay 80 bucks for this. So you have to go fast, fast, fast. And, you know, as you're going through, you're limited by time and every step of the way is sacrificed. And to me, that implies that either the price has to go up a little bit there or early on is where you have to invest your time. When we get there, I'm going to tell you, I think my priority is the early stages of the procedure up to mm. the matrix being placed from there, from the time you're actually placing your restoration. If you have your matrix in the right way, we, we can talk about bulk fill strategies, which are perfectly fair at the lowest price points. You know what I mean? But it's not fair to just start from the beginning, drill sloppy, matrix sloppy, overhanging margin, et cetera. So I think just, you know, to simple to break it down, dentistry is hard and we're forced to do things that are, a little too fast we can make them faster like right now i know i can do fillings very fast if i do bulk fill don't care about anatomy etc but right out of the gates out of dental school i couldn't you know what i mean it took some time so people come out they work somewhere they're told they have to do three fillings in this amount of time they don't really have anyone supervising them to say it's unacceptable they say it's fine it's fine it's fine and then we get to these types of things but it's not fine you know i mean there's really no world in which that's fine yeah. So we had a question come in. Um, someone said, Dr. Stanley, how did you look at open margins? I didn't catch the name. Oh, so that's with my, my AI company called Pearl. So we look at, we look at radiographs with um, artificial intelligence. Yeah, right. And that's, you know, even, even an insurance company, if you, if they saw that they wouldn't reimburse for that. Right. I mean, they don't always ask for post. I think they don't really, I did a lot of insurance for a while. They don't ask for post-op radiographs on uh, direct restorations frequently, yeah, right. almost never. So they don't know. They ask for pre-op and that's it. So you can mm -hmm. get away with it, but you would know like deep down, everyone would know that no one would want to pay for that if they understood what was going on. So how yeah. about for surgery? And it's, some, so? it's something that, you know, open margin is something that even a patient sees sometimes, you know, like if you show an x-ray, Patients right. are like, hey, that just doesn't look right. Like, you don't have to be a dentist to see that. Exactly. So yeah. tell us, so, you know, I think for me, that's what it comes down to. Like, it doesn't have to be beautiful. Yep. It doesn't have to match perfectly. Because yep. you know, bare minimum, what are my priorities in a dental restoration? It's going to be that it is... Uh, 
functioning, preventing sensitivity and expected to last for a certain amount of time without problems, you know, not forever, but a fair amount of time. You pay more. I had, I heard this saying and I love it. I really, really love it. In dentistry, the best you can do is buy time. How much time do you want to buy? Right. You know, you're literally, you know, you want to buy more time, cost more time. You're buying right. the time. It's like a trade off. But um, why don't you tell us a little, like in implants, because it's so different. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now you're dealing with a surgical component. What do you think are the standard of care when it comes to implant placements? Because you and I have both seen some ridiculous implant attempts, failures, surgeries, malpositionings, et cetera. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about how you look at this. Yeah, you just said it right there. I think one of the first things should be position. The implant should be placed in the correct position based on the restorative aspect. And that's, I think, where the disconnect comes. You know, we've, if you've restored implants, you've had something where if someone else has placed it or if you have placed it, it's made it difficult on the restorative side. And I think that's where implant dentistry has gone wrong for so long. It started off, you know, 40, 50 years ago with Dr. Branamark, where it was like, I only teach oral surgeons. And then it was, okay, periodontist. And then it was, you know, GPs or prosthodontists or restorative doctors. But because the foundation started in surgery, it has been this like, let's put the implant where it needs to go in the bone and figure out how to put a tooth on later. And that's, I think, comes from, again, the original aspect of implant dentistry, which was all full arch cases, pretty much. And now when you're in a, you know, a lateral position, and you have half a millimeter on each side of wiggle room, you can't go wrong. Otherwise, your score access hole is off, the, the material will fracture, you get food trapping. So number one for me would be a good position. And one of the biggest problems I see is actually depth of the implant. And we can go a little more, more into that later. But so, you know, buccolingual mesiodistal position and then occlusal gingival position, number one. Okay. Any How questions about, on it? Uh, is there number two and three and four or any uh, others? There Before? are two more. Two more? Or okay, I would no. say, sorry, there's three more. I don't want to take any away. So no, no questions on that. I agree. So like positioning is very important. I guess one question that would come to mind is, do you believe that in some cases, I, I know how big you are on guided surgery and I'm yeah. very on board. Do you think that being in the proper position requires guided or not always? I mean, I know that's the best approach, but is that an absolute requirement? Um, I think pilot hole guided should be. Okay. Because nowadays with the technology bringing the price down, I mean, you can get a pilot hole surgical guide for like mm -hmm. $70, you know, maybe even $50, depending on the, the system that you're using. Okay. And then if you're doing pilot hole, you don't need to buy a full guided kit. And, you know, full guided kit can be $7,000, $10,000. So right. that's just one pilot drill that you have to buy. And starting that will get you, I mean, you know, 80% of the way there. Okay. The problem with pilot hole drilling only is that it doesn't guide your depth um, at the final implant placement. And I think that's really important for my next, um, my next topic. Point. With okay, my wait, next point. Yeah. One more thing on the positioning then. So when you talk about positioning, if this takes from one of your other points, just uh, tell me it's coming up. But what about when people plan things but they let's say don't use ct but they do not factor in so they don't factor in the ct and everything looks good positions great contour is great but the whole buckle bone is <laughs> you know is that yeah. part of one of your other points or is that fall under positioning you know i didn't even think about that but yeah um it's so because it could look great right it's you can so have ingrained in my fun. head yeah and originally guided surgery started like that it was let's look on the model plan where the, where the tooth is, and then just drill in that position. You may know if there's bone there or not, but yeah, I didn't even think about that because CT is such a no brainer, but there's still a lot of people that are doing um, implants without CT scans. And I really think that that is a standard of care okay. for sure. Yeah. So thanks for right. bringing that up. It's gotta be in like, if from what I'm thinking, when you talk about position, 
there's the restorative aspect and getting some sort of good contours and reasonable like final restoration. Mm-hmm. And that has so many benefits. But in addition, there's, there's the ticking time bomb where if, if you had planned it and were able to go, you know, like into the bone, what would your disadvantage have been? Sometimes it's position, but other times it was just a matter of another half millimeter or a millimeter yeah. more lingual. And so having that information, I think is important because a lot of things that, we've had to go in and uh, scan or redo or like, let's just say like full mouth case with numerous existing implants. We're like, oh my God, all the buccal bone is gone. And you can only imagine. And when we have traced back the previous surgery, we confirmed it wasn't done with any particular guided aspect. And, you know, it's holding up, but I, I don't know. Like to me, it would, I would say that that's borderline standard of care. It was meant to go inside the implant, if it inside the bone. If it didn't start inside the bone because of planning, I would think that that's, you know, if it started and things changed, that's of course just aging and potential complication. But if you just never plan for it, you know, the saying, if you, what is it? If you fail to plan, plan to fail. fail. Yeah, exactly. Okay, tell us your next points. So next point would be um, stable bone and tissue. So that'd be periimplantitis. And in the past, that was very accepted. But now with the, with the biology that we know and the research and stuff from Thomas Linkovicius, we know that we really sh- can't avoid periimplantitis in, in most cases. So can that'd be number cannot. two. You can. Say can. Yeah, we okay. can, yeah. The ones where we can't, I think, is where research is coming that AI will actually help in, which is like genetic factors of people that we haven't okay. been able to prove yet, you know, okay. just because of who you are. The, the doctor did everything right. The patient did everything right. But for some reason, this still happened, you know? Gotcha. And, okay. and those, those may be more of like, you know, how you and I talk a lot about like true titanium allergies and things like right. that. Yeah. Um, no cement excess. So December this kind day. of, this yep. is kind of the, the surgical part of what you were talking about with margins, you know, intact margins, no cement excess, um, we know cement is really bad. It's the, the problem has been really ingrained in restorative dentistry that, well, this is how I put a regular crown on. So this is how I'm going to put a regular crown on an implant. And unfortunately it's just a, just a bad idea and very, and it's avoidable. Claim. It's avoidable, it avoidable with the right plan, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and it doesn't have a cost. I mean, it's just a matter of going back to step one, you know, like, this is what I meant about things building up on top of each other, you know, poor planning leads to deep margin leads, you know, it's like, it's really hard to recover every step, it becomes harder to recover when you started off wrong. That's why I really think a lot of the most important items for me come in the early stages, and they're very achievable. And most of the time, they're not even expensive. But as you go through the parts that are like the final result, the shape, the anatomy, the color, the contour, those are luxuries. You know, it's, if you have it in there and it's healthy. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So that was your, that's like, that's like a case that I'm working on right now that um, someone referred to us is it came from the restorative doctor and the crown on the implant lectures. And so initially you think like, Oh, it's the restorative doctor's problem. Right. And then Mm -hmm. When you start looking at it, you have it, you know, in the lab and or looking at a physical model, you're, the reason the crown broke was because the implant was placed a little too buckle. And this right. was the only way that the respirative doctor could do the crown. And so you know, who placed it, whether it was that doctor or not, but um, like you said, the beginning parts can really save you and it can make it uh, less expensive in the end. And you know what else is interesting about planning? Sometimes you plan and you have to pick a position that is not the most optimal restorative position, but because you planned, you were able to assess and make that decision in an informed manner. I have a patient right now that we have to do um, three implant placements. She wants zirconia implants. Um, You know, uh, anybody who knows me knows I'm not the biggest fan of them, but I'm open to them. You know, I think that there is a place for them. It's not my first choice. I'm very cautious on them, but I see the potential. I just don't think it's necessarily the obvious decision for everybody but there's a subset of patients that were now when you look at her bone and everything all along there's been discussions about oh implant here implant there and i keep looking i'm like i don't see that happening but i'm not doing the surgical planning i'm doing the restorative planning and there's another surgeon involved so we are now deciding where to go and the important thing is 
instead of having the implants placed and going, hey, patient, look how this contour is, I'm trying to educate her and show her this is what it will feel like. I'm going to make her a removable prosthetic that shows her like, you know, roughly yeah. what it would feel like against the tongue, et cetera. So sometimes you plan and it doesn't guarantee that you get a perfect, you know, shape. It right. means that you've perfectly planned what's achievable in that area. And then you avoid like, you know, you see those implants that come out of the uh, anterior maxilla at this mm -hmm. angle. Well, I mean, usually that's poor planning, but maybe sometimes possibly it's the only option. And when you've reviewed it and you've specifically chosen it and you've weighed all options, then it's just proper planning. It doesn't have to yeah. always be, you know, that that's a mistake. Yeah, it's well, never a mistake all, if it was intentional. Like, especially in implant dentistry, we've all seen crazy things that have been there 20 years, you know? Yes. And maybe yeah, it's yeah. one of those one of those kind of cases. So the yeah. last for me is using biologic materials. So materials that, especially subgingival is what's most important. So using polished titanium, polished zirconia, subgingival. That would be the last thing. Got you. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. Should we do the next point? Yeah, okay, so next point critical items you would require in your opinion? What are the absolute requirements to do the work? Do you expand a little bit on what that question means? Yeah, so we're going to do, we've talked about standard of care. So now it's like, how do you achieve these? So from a restorative standpoint, let me just answer some of these. So like for me, the critical items, let's talk about a filling, for example. It doesn't have to be the most beautiful prep, but it has to have clean, enamel margins, clean, as in like not caries, not demineralized. You got to have like a sound substrate and it's got to at least be caries free from a biomedic standpoint, caries free circumferentially around the dentin, uh, hold on a sec, uh, around the DEJ, you know, so we have this concept called the caries removal endpoint. And the idea is that you can get a strong successful restoration if you have a strong seal on the periphery of the tooth, which means the enamel, the DEJ, and one or two millimeters of your dentin. So you spend your time and it's very safe. And it's, I say spend your time, but it's actually very fast because you can clean the periphery without fear of pulp exposure. And so no matter how fast or yeah. slow you are, that's you know up to you, but it's not a slow concept to be requiring caries free on the periphery is a very reasonable and fair expectation of our profession. So you start with that. You Before you even start that, adequate isolation, which to me, isolate is still adequate, okay? I like rubber dam much better, but isolate is adequate. There are studies on it. Um, it helps, I would just guesstimating, I would say it cuts down contamination, moisture, et cetera, by probably on average 80 or 90%. The difficult scenario is gingival margins or subgingival areas, et cetera. Okay. You can or try lower, packing. lower jaw that don't have deep vestibules or something where you can still get saliva pulling up. Yeah. And I found with those, there's you when you use it a lot, you find the tricks, the cotton roll, you know, there's certain things you can do to help with those. But basically, I've been able to do a lot of good dentistry with Isolite, and I've seen a little bit of the stain margins, et cetera, but by no means a failed restoration. So Isolite or equivalent, you know, like any brand of intraoral suction that retracts the cheeks and tongues, okay? Um, without that, it's just, you know, at least not for adhesive dentistry, you know? And to me, yeah. standard of care and critical items are a composite restoration right now, you know, something resin composite restoration. So you do that next, and if you've already have the isolate and everything, the only difficult part left is tissue management and electrosurge works, laser works, even viscostat clear can be used to like cauterize the tissue. You leave it for a couple minutes and it really does a good job. So having good tissue control. And once you get a matrix band in, if it's positioned well, most of the time you've already cut down any uh, heme or bleeding from getting into your prep. There's actually a really cool product. When I didn't use isolate, when I didn't use rubber dam, I mean, I used isolate my matrix band for like a sectional system, like either Garrison, that was my go-to. Then the wedge, this was very important. There was a wedge that Garrison makes. I think they still make it. It's called the A plus wedge. Have you heard of this one? Is that the one that has the like, the mm -hmm. wings on it? No, better. It has astringent in there. So when you put it in, it does create hemostasis and it works really well. So you, you're wedging, but it's also oh, stopping bleeding right there. It works really well. So I only use that.
when I didn't use rubber dam. And early on in my career, that was a lot. So yeah. like I did do that for a while. So, you know, good hemostasis. Are you losing me? It looks back. like it's cutting out. Can you hear me? Or you're back. Okay, cool. Yeah. Great. So from there, immediate dentin sealing and resin coating, which is, it sounds, for those who don't know it, it sounds like, oh, great, another step. So it's the well, first step the to every- So on that? Because I know a lot of people ask you that. How long does that aspect take? You've, you've done your isolation that takes a few minutes. Um, yep. You know, you've done your peripheral seal. You're yep. about to do your immediate dentin sealing with resin coating. What is the yeah. time from when you start that till you finish it? Yeah, so like backing up all the steps I talked about, honestly, I would say if you're already prepping and doing caries removal, I think on average we're talking, you know, a couple extra bucks for a good isolation, maybe two extra minutes. I mean, you still have to remove caries. I'm not even saying your margin has to be perfect. You know, I'm yeah. just saying caries free, you know, like that's the most basic expectation. So a couple minutes on that side. Now, when it comes to me, dentin sealing, how long does that take? So you have everything in place to go uh, two minutes max. You prime. Okay. Um, depending on what system you use, I don't want to get too specific because I'm really familiar and recommending total etch and self etch systems, but either one of them, two minutes max, maybe even just one minute. Cause if you add up the time, let's, let's use a self, uh, self etching system. You okay. prime, you air dry that well, whole etching step. first, right? No, or with self together. That's right. With self etching system, mm -hmm. you have the option yeah. of selective etching the enamel. But if we're talking about minimum requirements, you don't need that. It still right. does etch and bond. You get a lower bond strength. But if we're again, if we're talking about minimum requirements, that's fine. You get a bond. It does work. And if you're doing these things for like a hundred dollars or eighty dollars, I think it's very fair to do these steps. You know, the, the problems we see are like the other things. So yeah. you prime everything and we're talking 30 seconds max. You prime for 10 to 20, you air dry, priming is done. Apply your adhesive and cure, okay? Um, I like to wick up the excess adhesive, but still we're talking another 30 seconds. So it's one minute there. And then flowable on all the dentin surface. And that takes not a minute. You know, you put right. some flowable down, you use your probe and drag it around, cure again. Okay. So we're talking about less than five minutes to potentially increase your bond strength 400%. Uh, well, in this case, that's a good question. So if, okay, up to this point, you, the minute you cure your adhesive, your bond strength has started, right? So right. from that point, if you want to increase it maximum, you have to like wait hands off and either do low stress increments, like start filling incrementally Which or work on, or, takes or work on another mm -hmm. tooth. But so here's like, if you're in an office that does, these things, my experience has been, you're usually doing a few teeth at once. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you could right? I mean, I'm, I'm not totally an expert on that, but I usually don't see a lot of these offices that do $80 fillings doing one at a time. I usually see them doing a quadrant or so on. So you basically would do the steps we talked about and then do the same on the next, so, you know, you could prep them all at the same time, but do this, do this, do this, then go back to this one. And it's been a few minutes. If, if you wait, Five minutes, it's a great amount of time. But if you're on a budget, even if you don't wait, you know, I'm talking about minimum expectations of yeah. quality, okay? You, just getting to the point that you've resin coated, used a good system and everything, you've already, because what's going to happen is when you put on the composite, especially if you bulk fill it now, if there is too much polymerization stress, most likely the gap is going to be between your composite and the flowable, not it's between fine. some, which it, it's better, you know, it's, it's like, yeah. it's not perfect, but right. it's not likely to be a sensitive restoration. Yep. You're still likely to have, you know, good margins from everything else we've talked about you're not likely to have symptoms so this is you know like i know give me any patient i can do this technique i can do that type of filling in my drilling is slow so i'm not gonna lie but let's say like whatever your drilling is from drilling to finish i can be doing that in like five minutes tops you know what i mean because yeah. we just said the immediate dentin sealing and if i have no other tooth to work on i'll fill that one but if i have two or three others i'll go one two three come back and fill this one come back and fill this one come back and fill this so one allowing that bond to mature even a few minutes will help in that it's, case. it's it's good and that's important because people have to realize that 
resin is a reaction, you know, polymerization is a reaction. I mean, and the light started it and there's no exceptions to this. It's not instant. It's not like you flip a switch and it went from uh, like flowable to solid, just like that. You know, mm -hmm. it's not a snap. It, it, it's kind of a snap, but it's not a full polymerization and it takes time up to 48 hours. But I would say in the first, if you look at the curve of these things, if you have a graph like this, yeah, I remember you in the early stages, early yeah. stages, it rises, then it slows down. So like, you know, going from five minutes to 48 hours, you get another maybe five or 10%. But in the early stages, if it never, if you, if you have too much stress, it never actually makes a bond. And if something doesn't bond, it never bonds. So the worst thing you can do is not put the flowable, then bulk fill it instantly. Then you have a very high chance of getting separation in between your dentin and your adhesive layer and also using poor quality adhesive. So the difference in price between a good system and a cheaper system is relatively ne negligible on a per use basis, you know? Yeah. So um, if you use a better system right off the bat, then you're less likely to have these problems. And I'm talking like $50 difference for the bottle, but the bottle can handle like 50 to hundred restorations. Yeah. So it's like maybe a dollar more. And from a practice management standpoint, you bring up a good point with the sensitivity. Because sensitivity can be an expensive thing to manage, right? It is. Because nobody's okay in, with it, right? Yeah. The, the patient comes back in. Are you going to charge them again to, you know, do something again? Or when they come in for a post-op, you know, most of the time you don't need a post-op for a composite. But when they come in with sensitivity, then you're taking up chair time with that too. So doing it right, taking those first few steps, like you talked about with isolation, getting the, the margin good, um, peripheral seal zone, and then doing the immediate dentin sealing with yep. resin coating. It's not that many steps. You it's just have it's to do not. It, correctly. And somebody... it doesn't take that much time and it's not that expensive. And somebody asks, so you charge extra for IDS? And no, I'm not. I, the whole, this whole conversation isn't about charging extra. It's about what I believe are the minimum requirements to give a fair quality restoration. And also literally the extra, I would say we've, at most we're talking an extra two or three minutes, but I would firmly say that you would right. save your practice at least that amount of time in uh, post-ops, et cetera. You know what I mean? The yeah. benefit of these things too, is you have to factor in all your time, you know, to be done in 15 minutes, but have to do a free post-op. It doesn't really help you when the patient's sensitive or replacement and, and, and even, so on. Even your team's time too, when you think of that patient's going to be calling, call. asking yep. your team, Oh, I'm sensitive. What's this? I mean, you know, our, our front office could be calling, getting another patient in scheduled for treatment, you know, pre-booking things. Yeah. So it's the whole, yeah, so the whole idea and also you got to think from a marketing standpoint and too. It's true. You know, and the two people are sitting having lunch and someone says, Oh yeah, I just got this filling done and it's just driving me crazy. And the other person says, well, I, I got a feeling done. I never had any sensitivity. Right. And you that's know, a reasonable expectation, like, right? I mean, like yeah. who's, who's saying I want, like, first of all, half these patients, half the time we're diagnosing them and doing these things. They're not coming out. We put it on our informed consent, but I'm going right. to tell you right now that, they are avoidable over 95% of the time. You know, it's not supposed to be expected or normal. It's avoidable. It's only so normal because of the technique. So the word immediate dentin sealing, guys, just to clarify this for everybody, is that all direct composites, by definition, have some form of immediate dentin sealing. The fact that you cure the adhesive before you move on to the filling is immediate dentin sealing okay but if you expand on that term to do like optimal immediate dentin sealing or like give it the best immediate dentin sealing maybe you've added one minute you know what i mean so you're not doing an extra step you know you're just using the best product and maybe an extra minute of time to do that step better but you're doing it you know everybody if not doing immediate dentin sealing would go like this you prime, you put your adhesive on, you don't cure anything, you put composite on top of it and you cure your composite and your adhesive together, that would be not immediate dentin sealing, okay? Like delayed dentin sealing or something. We never do that on direct composites. The term really has, I use it everywhere for like simplicity. The term is really meant for 
indirect restorations where it's much more common right. to like not do it. But to, to try to bring things together, I try to like draw attention to the fact that direct restorations are getting immediate dent and sealing by every provider essentially. There's very few people that don't cure their adhesive. Some do that, but it's very, very rare and it's not a good idea. Yeah. Um, I think we should maybe like, I think we should maybe just talk about the next couple and then do yours at the same time. Cause it's like, they almost flow together, you know, like patient okay. expectation. So sure. like for me, the, the require, so from this point, by the way, immediate end ceiling, I, like I said, you go to the next tooth if you can, if you have no, nothing else to work on, go ahead and fill it. The whole five minute thing is an optimal thing. It is good. But if your price point is $50, $80, just the fact that you at least got those couple things, carries free periphery, um, high bondable surface, good bonding agent, fair isolation. Those were the most important aspects. Anatomy and incremental layering, those are phenomenal, but they're not going to come at $80 for a filling. It has to be fair to you as well. So I think if someone's paying $80 or $100 for a filling and it's taking you, this whole process takes you 25 minutes or 30 minutes, it's already slight. I mean, it's, I think it's still unfair to the dentist, to be honest, but it's, you don't owe anything else. You know what I mean? That is reason if a good margin, whatever, then you bulk fill. And my preference actually would not be to use a bulk fill composite material, but just bulk fill with something like APX. The problem with a lot of those ones that are actual bulk fill materials is they are much uh, essentially Less softer. Filled, right? Well, the modulus is lower. So the, the stiffness okay. is lower essentially. And um, while that is good for shrinkage stress, it's not good for mechanical properties. Looking at all the options, I'm okay with there being a slight First of all, the shrinkage stress difference isn't huge when you compare the two of them, but the stiffness is. So I would use something like APX, a solid restorative composite, and either bulk fill or two increments. I mean, sometimes literally yeah, it takes less time to... Take, yeah. Exactly. But I wouldn't do anatomy, decoupling, all these things that I love to do. I think those are when people pay for them. They take more time. So the minimum requirement for a fair restoration is those things. And when someone is on Functional. a budget, and that's... It's functional. Yeah. You functional, know, it, it's not perfect. Biologically sound. It's yeah. not perfect, but it's acceptable. Um, okay. So that's, that brings me to patient expectations. So like, what does a patient expect when they get these? Well, in our office, a combination of symptoms, like I would say our patients value uh, the anatomy, how it looks, minimally invasive, all that stuff. But deep down, the things they really care about. If I took anatomy out of the equation, I wouldn't lose that much business. I do it because I enjoy to do it. I know it has some advantages, especially when you're layering cusp by cusp. My patients appreciate that they trust me to do the best, but they're not specifically going, I need better anatomy in this molar right. or the premolar, but they go hand in hand. When you're sculpting a cusp one cusp at a time, you are essentially buying time, decoupling. There's all these different concepts, but from a patient standpoint, their expectation is that it's not sensitive, that it is going to hold up uh, depending on the price point. I think a filling should be, <laughs> insurance says two years, right? I think it should be five because if you have to go in every two years, you know that that pulp is not going to survive yeah, and you're giving like into, you know, you're giving into the whole concept that dentistry is guaranteed to result in root canals and crowns. So I think five years is like the minimum reasonable expectation. I also think that even poorly done composites typically last that long. So it's very reasonable to expect five or more years. Okay. And what happens is when you think about insurance fee schedules for these things, the question you have to ask yourself, I've seen different prices. I remember the first composite I ever did in my practice in Simi Valley, it was a two surface composite and it was like $72 and I spent three hours on it, you know? And I was just like, how am I ever going to make money? They got a great value. Yeah. They got a great value. I did this guy's whole mouth. Uh, he's still a patient actually. He comes to our office every now and then, you know, he lives in Simi Valley, but he comes down. He, um, I did his whole mouth and the most I had probably charged was about 150 at the time for like a, a, a an MO filling and a separate DO filling, you know, yeah. two, two surfaces at $70, $75 or something. But my concept was I'm building my patient base. I'm going to, I'm going to raise my fees. That wasn't fair to me. I can't do that. You know, like I wasn't making money, but I was building my habits, my techniques, my clientele. 
And so I think that I, I left that insurance right away. But at that $75 price point, I could have done the bulk fill, you know, it, it, it would have been it would have been not three hours. You know what I mean? The time I spent was a combination of a lot of things, including rubber dam at that one. But I think with insurance, the important thing is to look at your goal of compensation, whatever it is, hundred dollars an hour, 200, you need to look at your overhead, what it costs for your staff, your rent and everything. And then how much you want to leave and decide from there. But you should never let insurance make you do substandard quality. Unfortunately, they pushed it to that level very close. Okay. But I do think that HMO offices and high volume offices can still be held to the same standards of doing fair quality. Like we talked about, it's not, it's doing nobody service to give them the overhangs and this and that. So if you can't do it on the fee schedule, it's your duty to try to find a way to leave and educate people as to that. There's, it's hard to play tricks. I've seen people like upsell the patients, but right. if, if they don't go for the upsell, you can't go back to the overhanging margin. You have to give them the bare minimum. So if you're going to upsell, I know this strategy and it's, I hate the word upsell because it implies that it's not a valuable upgrade. I'm talking about a valuable upgrade. You can go, And you can tell the patient if I layer it and do this anatomy and, you know, spend more time, it's good. And there's ways I've seen somebody do this. I've never done myself, but I know somebody that'll take a piece of ribbon fiber and ribbon is like, you know, you know what a ribbon is, right? So it's that fiber that you can put into a filling. And if you put that in and you do incremental filling, you can specify it as an unspecified restorative procedure. And if insurance doesn't cover the patient still responsible for it, from what I've been told, it makes sense knowing what I know about insurance. So you're not charging for the fiber. I mean, to, when insurance looks at it, it almost looks like you're charging for the fiber, but you're charging for the difference between a bulk fill and spending the time to do a stress reduced application technique. And ribbon just so happens to be like the material that falls under the, because there's no, you can't, do a code for I layered it and I did increments, right, but yeah. you can do a code for I did a filling incorporating ribbon for stress reduction, lump it all together. And it's a valuable upgrade. So that works really well for some people. I can't like attest to it myself because I haven't used it in that way, but I know that the filling is better. So that's, that's a fair approach, but when they don't pick it, it's not fair to go back to like, Oh, they didn't want it. So I give them garbage again. Right. So I think people need to really look at their insurances. There's some that are fair. There's some that aren't. I know everything that happened with Delta made it very unfair for a lot of these things, but it's our responsibility to hold the standards. You can't base it just on the insurance. We have to fight back against that and work on that. Yeah. I'm going to remind everybody, put your comments in the comment box and then we'll, we'll um, get to them at the end. Okay, so we've talked about standard of care from the restorative standpoint. We've talked about the critical items that you need yep. um, and patient expectations. Anything else on patient expectations for that? No, I, I think and I covered the insurance and fee schedules, essentially. I think we can have you answer. I'm just going to answer this guy. Okay. Just one question that's on that note. Like, what would be a good appointment time for a class two composite? I, I think that if you're doing the reasonable quality I would be shooting for one hour for two composites, you know, two or maybe even three composites. Um, If you can do a quadrant or something like that for one, maybe 30 minutes of doctor time, 10 minutes of assistant time to seat the patient, take the blood pressure, stuff like that. But, and I mean, by good time, I mean, if you're not doing incremental filling, like the basic requirements of the filling because by the time you've cleaned it out you can really get this thing done in about five minutes if you're doing the reasonable quality not the best now if you can charge somewhere in the middle there's a lot of things i would change you know incremental and so on but if you're doing the minimum this is my threshold and for a crown i would say uh, depends on how well trained your assistants are but doctor time could probably be about 40 minutes 30 or 40 minutes and then assistant temporary i make my own temporaries i know it's not easy. I, I don't see assistants that do them well, but remember we had an assistant that did it incredible. We had one assistant that did it better than I can make them still. And she was essentially a lab technician, yeah. but she was in our office doing temporary. So depends on your setup, but I would say uh, 40 minutes of doctor time, probably 30 minutes of assistant time in that type of office. You know, I'm still big on taking my own impression, but you have to understand things are trainable, you know, like you can't say assistants can't take a good impression. What you have to say is it takes a lot of training to make an assistant take a good impression. It's not 
a fact. It's a matter of how much time can you invest. But the problem is to, to say they can't and not train them and then just live with that forever. That's the problem. All these things are trainable. It's just a matter of how much time and effort will you put into training. So I think crown appointments could be 40 minutes of doctor time, 30 minutes of assistant time in the low quality, not low quality, in the fair quality, low compensation insurance realm. Right. Okay. Your turn, buddy. Okay. So I'm wondering if we should end and come back because we probably only have like seven minutes and then do the rest in another one. Well, should we, let's end it because um, Instagram will cut us off. Okay. Oh, but that, but then we'll lose all of our questions. Let's see. Let's, let's try. Let's, the let's try. You don't want to try the questions that are related to you though, because a lot okay. of these are um, are kind of restorative. Okay. Okay. What is your opinion on laser cavity prep? Oh, um, I've I've done a lot of research on that. There's nothing wrong with laser cavity preparation. I still for mar I prefer for margins using a burr. I don't mind using a laser for dent. And there's some papers that look at the bond strength, etc. But my favorite, like the reason I don't use it, is because my favorite that gives me almost all the same advantages, maybe even more actually is air abrasion. So I like air abrasion. It gives me precise control. It has, uh, it's very selective. Um, I use it for other stuff in the procedure. So for the same reasons I would consider using it, I prefer to use my air abrader. And the other thing is electric handpiece. So the combination of the two, but it doesn't mean you can't use it, but you definitely aren't getting a specific advantage over my protocol. So it comes down to preference, you know, and my fear was that it lowers bond strength, but I've looked at enough papers to see that, you know, it does settings do have an impact on it, but it can be done very fairly where you don't lose bond strength, but you need to know your settings, what type of laser, et cetera. And it doesn't improve my bond strengths over the way I do it. So I don't want to add any extra complexity. It needs to have an advantage, which I don't see right now. Yeah. Okay. So Any other I'm questions? Saying, how, how do you charge for minimally invasive restorations? I'm not sure I don't, if I truly I, understand the question, but er, everything, everything we do, I do, or we do is minimally invasive. invasive. Yeah. So I never, I never treatment plan this versus that. I, I will talk about in an informed consent that an in layer on lay is my first recommendation. Crown is an alternative, but I don't recommend it because we take away extra tooth. But I definitely don't have a price difference between the two. You know, so yeah. one way I encourage this type of stuff is based on what I believe and also my time. I don't take yeah, much but that's longer. kind of just our philosophy, right? Exactly, I mean, and if you for come me, to our practice, you're going to get as minimally invasive as possible. I spend a little bit a little bit more time on average on an inlay yeah. than a, a crown, but not enough that I have to charge differently for it. So in order to neutralize any benefit of this is better or upgrade, indirect restorations are the same fee. Okay. Um, next question. Isn't making more direct and less crowns slash indirect less rewarding economically? So they're saying more like, direct. If you're doing more direct, you're not going to make as much money. Well, okay, so the problem I see with that is it's only true in insurance-based offices where you're incentivized to upgrade, you know what I mean? Right. Like, and in other words, you look at it and go, up oh, structurally compromised, you know, needs a buildup in a crown, yes. But in, if you want to break free of that, it's very hard to break free within like a, a set of rules that insurance imposes on you. You know, insurance is putting all these rules on top of you and you're trying to play within the rules, then all of a sudden you're incentivized to do things which I would consider unethical. You know, like if you don't think it's necessary and you're doing it for compensation, it's because of your restraints. In our practice, I made it so financially, the difference is negligible. I charge for the direct right. filling and the inlay, essentially the difference in the, the, lab, proceed, the lab bill and the extra visit. So they balance out still technically an inlay makes me a little bit more money, but not enough where I want to, you know what I mean? Just a little bit right. more, maybe another hundred dollars or $200, but not enough where I want to go through and do that. I don't want to be encouraged to try to do something for money. Now in insurance space, yes, that does come into play, but the problem is you can still do certain things. Like if you're going to do 
a filling versus a crown, that's a big jump. But if you're talking about going from filling to three quarter crown, there's still some good reimbursement on these things and onlays are also covered, et cetera. So there is ways to fall in between, but it, it does do that. So that's why I told you some people when they want to do a filling, they do that unspecified code and they charge extra for the filling so that it's taking away any incentive, incentive to go with crown. So they're getting what insurance pays Plus, I think it's like 250 or $300 from the patient to do a biomedic filling. And they're happy with that. I know people that do that approach. Okay. And then last question on here, not necessarily related to you, but kind of just related to both of us. I just don't want to lose the question when we go to the next one is yeah. what do we think about using care credit as a way to maybe help patients to help. with the treatment? Yeah. So I think anything, anything that helps your patient. Are we up? Oh. Are we still there? Okay, so anything that we're back that helps your yeah. patients like that is good. But the problem that we've had in our office is not enough people utilize it. So our staff, like anytime we go to use it, our staff has to like try to remember the login, Relearn. how to use it. Yeah. So if you can make it a normal protocol in your practice, I'm completely for it. It takes six, per like I would offer personally the 6%, uh, the six month 6% 6 option and just six stay months. there, which means you get the patient pays no interest. You take 6% out. It's only 3% more than a credit card, give or take. And it helps both of you out. It's a good compromise. I wouldn't take 20% and all these other ones unless the patient wants to take the interest. But offering those, I think, is a fair and good way. But the, my caveat is, if you don't use it routinely, it slows you down. You know the number of times that we've talked about it, staff comes, that I do it right, that I check it. I want, like, if you're trying to be efficient, you have to get an efficient protocol, which means setting your rules and not going outside of them. So, like, I'm really big on you set your system, you follow the rules, stop making exceptions for every single patient because the exception means the staff has to ask you and you get bogged down. And what we want to do is dentistry, not, like, constantly trying to figure out exceptions and what we can do and how we can accommodate. So find something that works for most people, stick with it. And care credit, I think is a good option yeah, for a lot of I things. I think to expand on that, we have to remember what like our UCR fees are, let's say, and then insurance is basically a discount plan, right? It's, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'll give your patients a discount if you send them to me is ultimately what it is. Yeah. And um, if you're already taking a discount on that, and then like you said, you take the 20% discount on top of um, care credit, you know, you're down... Yeah. 40, 50, 60% off of what your kind of normal fee should be. And that's when I think yeah. people get in trouble. So we've got, good. We answered most of those questions. I'm going to end it. We're going to come back and we'll keep going. Sounds good. So come back on everybody.